Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. This is the second video in the unit Electrostatics and we'll be studying electric field now. Previously when we studied gravitational forces, immediately we moved on to gravitational field. And we'll see the same sort of pattern followed here. In fact, most of the things we saw in gravitational forces, we'll see again in electric forces, just some of the symbols might be changed. Right. So first of all, it's a very interesting fact to know that there are two things which completely determine electrodynamics. We'll need a couple of more formulas for magnetism, but there are two small principles which determine everything in electrodynamics. The first is Coulomb's law. And the second is the principle of superposition. The principle of superposition states that the electric force between any two objects is independent of the electric force between any two other objects. So for example, if there are four objects here, the electric force between these two charges will be the same as the electric force between these two charges if these two charges were not present. The presence of these two charges, while it may alter the net force experienced by this charge, it will not change the force between these two charges. Similarly, these two charges will not alter the force experienced between these two charges and the first two charges will not alter the force experienced between these two charges. So why, if the, these two charges were not present, the force on this charge would be different from what it were now. But the force between these two charges is completely independent of any other charge. So whenever we are trying to find out the force between many charged particles, all we need to do is use Coulomb's law to find out the force between any two. That would be the force between those two regardless of any other charge distribution and do it for all pairs of charges and add them up. It's really interesting to know that using just these two principles, essentially we could be able to solve any problem in electrodynamics. If we have a solid sphere and we have two what is called a dipole, we'll study this later, a some small positive and negative charge coupled together, then we will be able to find the force between them. All we need to do is find out the force between every single particle on the sphere and every single particle on this dipole and just add them all up using the principle of superposition. So technically we are completely done with electrodynamics and we should be moving on to magnetism. Except the mathematics of solving these problems is not generally this simple and so we devise a lot of other concepts for example the concept of electric field or the Gauss law or the electric potential or the concepts of equipotential surfaces and these concepts are only created to help us solve problems like these without having to go into complicated mathematics. If you had an infinitely powerful computer and you fed the computer with these two instructions Theoretically, the computer would be able to solve every problem involving electrodynamics. But we've devised a lot of concepts to make these problem solving easier. The first of these concepts is electric field. Now, what did we see with gravitational forces? We had gravitational forces, which was the force between two particles. And then we had gravitational field which was the force per unit mass. And the advantage of using gravitational field was we did not have to worry about what the source charges were. Either we could say that we have these three charges and these three charges create gravitational forces on a fourth charge. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm making a mistake. These three masses. Right. When we talk about electric forces, we talk about charges. When we talk about gravitational forces, we talk about masses. Right. My bad. So if we have these three masses and these three masses are attracting another mass, then we could actually calculate the force on this by calculating the force due to each individual mass and adding them up. However, an easier way to frame the problem would be instead of giving us these three charges, just telling us that this mass moves in a region in which the force per unit mass is maybe x cube i hat plus 3xy j hat and something else or maybe it's just in two dimensions. So either we can actually give the configuration and ask the person solving the problem 
to come up with the force themselves or we can simply give the force per unit mass and get the person to get the force which they can use to solve the problem further. So this is the advantage of using force per unit mass. We don't have to worry about how this field is being created. The moment somebody says a gravitational field following this particular formula has been created, we can solve the problem just using this field without worrying about how it was created. So goes the concept of electric forces and electric fields. Completely similar, just mass is replaced by charge. Electric forces between let's say two positively charged objects which will repel each other. And then we have electric fields. So either we could tell a person solving the problem that we have this configuration of charges and we need the force on a particular positive charge present here and they could solve it using this configuration by using Coulomb's law and the principle of superposition again and again or we could simply give them doing the legwork ourselves we could give them the fact that this charge is moving in a region where the force per unit charge now is x cube y hat plus 3 x y j hat in that case the force experienced by this particle will be its particular charge multiplied by this field. Remember, if this particle's charge changes, or in this case, this particle's mass changes, the force experienced by it changes. But the only thing specific to this particle in the formula is its own mass. So if we remove its own mass from the equation, everything else is a constant that is independent of this particle. If we change the particle, everything else will change, everything else will be the same, but this particular mass will change. So in this case, we use the formula that the gravitational force is equal to the mass times the gravitational field. And here electric field is represented by E. So we'll use the fact that the force is equal to the charge multiplied by the electric field. Right. So let's see this again from another point of view. We have a whole bunch of positive and negative charges. And we need to calculate, for example, something about the motion of a positive charge that has been thrown in a particular direction. Right. So either we could use Coulomb's law for each individual particle in this configuration and this particular particle. And we could use superposition principle and add up all the forces, which would be quite hard. Or we could use previously known results about the electric field created by this particular configuration. If we happen to know that the electric field created by this particular configuration at this point is let's say 5 units upwards and this particular charge has a value of 2 units, 2 coulombs, then it will experience a force of 10 newtons upwards. Right. Now instead of 2 coulombs, if the particle had a charge of 4 coulombs, then it would experience a force of 20 newtons. But the electric field would still be 5 units. Right. So this is the advantage of talking in terms of electric field. Now the next step obviously is to look at the electric field of some standard charge distributions. So first of all a standard point charge. If we have a point sorry if we have a point charge which has a magnitude q in that case it creates an electric field which is equal to kq by r square r hat r hat denotes the direction. So if I look at this point, the electric field at this point, the direction will be this r hat. Remember the direction we talked about it in the last video from the particle which exerts the force to the particle which is experiencing the force. So this is the direction and the magnitude of the electric field will be kq by r square where this distance is r. So if we put another particle here which has a charge of q2 then it will experience a force of k q q2 by r square in this direction. And that result is the same as the result we would have gotten if we had used Coulomb's law. Right. So the electric field due to a point charge is k q by r square r hat. The next step, the electric field due to a uniform ring. So let's say we have a uniform circular ring and the radius of the ring is a and we need the electric field at let's say a distance x from a. Right. Now we've seen a similar gravitational force in the ring and we saw by symmetry that for example if this particle attracts in this direction that the diametrically opposite particle which will attract in this direction and their vertical components will cancel out. 
similarly this particle this part of the ring attracts uh, this particular point in a direction and the diametrically opposite part attracts it in another direction such that the vertical components of those two will be the opposite of each other by symmetry so in other words by symmetry we can say that if, if this is a ring of uniform mass then the gravitational field will be in this direction if this is a ring of uniform charge however or charge per unit latent lambda lambda is the symbol for charge per unit length so if we have a uniform ring of radius a and charge per unit length lambda then the electric field will actually be of the of the top part will not be towards it it will be away from it remember that is the biggest difference between electricity and gravitation gravitation always attracts electric forces can attract or repel and for a positive charge the electric field is away from it so that another positive charge will feel a repulsive force a negative charge will feel an attractive force because the minus sign will come from the charge similarly this particular part at the bottom will if we just look at it and apply kq by r square will have an electric field in this direction and those two will cancel the vertical components and the net electric field will be in this direction right so how much will it be let's calculate the electric field due to each individual part let's say this particle has a charge of dq a differential element so the electric field due to this will be k times dq by r square r will be root of a squared plus x squared so a squared plus x squared but this is the electric field in this direction and we need the component in the horizontal direction so if this angle is theta then we'll need cos theta right and what is cos theta cos theta will be x by root of a square plus x square so we have x by root of a square plus x square now if we integrate it all everything is the same everything is a constant except for dq and if we integrate dq we'll ultimately get q right so the answer for this is that the electric field due to a uniform ring will actually be k q x by a squared plus x squared to the power 3 by 2 away right now if just if to see the similarity between this and the gravitational case you can go back in your notes and see if we have a uniform ring of mass m and of radius a and we want the gravitational field a distance x away from it we know that it will be in the left direction and you can check that its value will be uh, g m x by a square plus x square to the power 3 by 2 and this should be expected because the only dif two differences again i keep repeating this because if you understand this concept you don't need to learn two separate chapters electricity and gravitation you can just learn one and the other will come automatically only two differences between electricity and gravitation one gravitational forces are always attractive so the gravitational field is towards the object electric forces can be attractive or repulsive and electric field for a positive charge is away from the object electric field for a negative charge is towards the object the second difference instead of a q charge we have a mass m and of course since they're two different forces the proportionality constants are different one has k and the other has g other than that all of the results are completely same we see that if x is zero the gravitational force will be zero because it will be attracted equally from all sides and if x is zero the electric field will be zero because it will be repulsed equally from all sides right so the, some of the other results i'm not going to do now i'm just going to ex write the results and explain them a little bit and the uh, the actual numerical derivation will be exactly the same as we did for the case of gravitational forces and fields so let's take a uniform spherical shell uh, let's say it has a radius r let's say that it, it has a radius a r we'll use for the variable and it has a charge q remember this is a shell now we'll talk about a solid sphere later on so for a shell what was the result we saw in gravitation that if the point is outside the shell let's say the distance is r then we can just assume that the shell is actually a point mass placed at the center of the shell and the gravitational field would have been gm by r square and here the electric field will be k q by r square r hat that is in the outside direction so this particular spherical shell outside of it will treat everything exactly the same way as a point mass point particle of charge q kept at the center would have treated 
However, if you are going inside the shell, then similarly for the gravitational case, the electric field will be zero. So electric field will be this outside, meaning R is greater than A, and electric field will be zero inside, which means R is less than A. Right? This is the same as the case for gravitational forces in a uniform spherical shell. What did we get for a uniform solid sphere? A solid sphere, let's say, of radius A and a total charge Q. Well, again, if it was outside, we could just uh, we could split it into many shells. Each shell could be treated as a point mass placed at the center. So the total solid sphere could be treated as a point mass placed at the center. Similarly, for the case of electric forces. Right. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to try to do it yourself. The only reason I'm not doing it is because at any point if you have confusion, you can go back to the gravitational forces and check it out for yourself. It's exactly the same except there might be a minus sign somewhere and G is replaced by K and M is replaced by Q. Right. So the electric field outside will again be K Q by R square R hat. But if it's inside then we'll divide it into two particular parts, right? We'll have a solid sphere inside and we'll have a shell outside. The shell outside will not contribute anything because if we divide it into a number of shells, for each shell, the gravitational and electric force within it is zero, right? So if it is inside, then only the part inside will contribute. And obviously, if it is a uniform solid sphere, then the mass per unit uh, volume will be constant, the density will be constant, or in this case, the charge per unit volume will be constant, and you can actually calculate the charge within a radius r if the total radius is a. And it will come out to be kqr by a cube r hat inside. We said that we see that when r is equal to a. This gives us kq by a square r hat and this also gives us kq by a square r hat which means the result is the same for both. Right. One final topic when we are talking about electric fields, there is something which is called electric field lines which are not really a actual concept, just a theoretical abstract concept created so that we can visualize things more easily. Electric field lines are diagrams drawn such that, for example, these might be a positive and a negative charge. So the electric field lines will be something like this. They will have arrows. But electric field lines are lines which denote the direction of forces experienced by charges. For example, if you keep a charge here, the positive charge will uh, repel it in this direction and the negative charge will attract it in this direction and the actual force will be somewhere in this direction. So this is the electric field line in this case. If you leave a charge here, it probably move on this line and move to the other place. Right. So electric field lines are just lines which denote the direction of forces. Now they, they have a particular property. No two electric field lines can ever cross because then at this point you would have two different directions of forces which cannot be true. Right. The electric field lines of a single particle are like this. And as, as you go further out, the number of field lines per unit area keep on decreasing. And that is a symbol of the fact that the magnitude of electric field keeps on decreasing. Right. So we saw the analog of gravitational field that was electric field. In the next video, we'll see the analog of gravitational potential and gravitational potential energy. And they will be, of course, the electric potential and the electric potential energy. Thank you.